Two years ago, Chloe Udaly was in the middle of her first ever campaign for public office. Fast forward, and she's now an outspoken member of the Portland City Council, and was just given a critical job overseeing the city's transportation bureau. Tonight, Udaly joins us to discuss her vision for the bureau, including the future of those ubiquitous e-scooters, and more. Plus, later in the show, We'll discuss concerns about harassment in Portland's tech industry. New report shows one in six women have reported facing workplace harassment. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Some changes at Portland City Hall. The mayor has reassigned bureaus and the Department of Transportation, which was headed up by outgoing Commissioner Dan Saltzman, will now be led by Commissioner Chloe Udaly. What are her plans for the bureau that affects all Portlanders in one way or another and is vital to Portland's future? Udaly was also the most vocal supporter of the Occupy ICE movement. We'll ask about her reflections now that the camp is disbanded. And later in the show, one in six women has faced workplace harassment, and that includes women here at home in Portland's tech industry. A new survey of 800 people exposes the problem and challenges us all to be part of a solution. First, welcome to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Chloe Udaly. Welcome back to Straight Talk. It's nice to have you here. Thank you, Laurel. Nice to be here. You'll soon be taking over the Bureau of Transportation, a really big responsibility. How are you feeling about that? Uh, well, I'd say I'm feeling excited, if not a little daunted. We suspected this would be the case, but I actually didn't know for sure that I would be the new commissioner in charge until I was um, on vacation a couple weeks ago. So I've just gotten back on Monday and I'm starting to dig in to the Bureau, which is officially handed off to me after Labor Day weekend. And one of the ways you're digging in, I understand, is going to a class with your staff at PSU? Yeah, we're really excited about it. So Congressman Earl Blumenauer was also once a member of Portland City Council and the commissioner in charge of transportation. And he developed this program for lay people at PSU to learn about traffic uh, planning and engineering. And uh, every year the class comes up with a project that they try to sell to council. So um, we're excited to take that class and really uh, dig into all the issues and, and work with the community. I know it's early on, but do you have an idea what your focus will be with the Bureau of Transportation? Well, Vision Zero will continue to be a focus for sure. And Vision uh, Zero is trying to bring the traffic fatalities in Portland down to zero by 2025, is. which is yes. a big goal. It is a big goal, especially considering we saw fatalities go up last year. So we're gonna be looking uh, very seriously at that. Uh, when I think of Peabot, of course, I think of potholes and parking. So those will also be uh, big topics, but we, um, there's a lot of fun stuff too. We oversee block parties and street fairs and uh, collaborate with parks on Sunday parkways. So it's a very um, wi wide ranging responsibilities involved. And one of the things that it's fun and also a big responsibility is overseeing this new pilot program with the e-scooters. We're seeing them everywhere. How do you feel about them? Yeah, just my luck that that launched right before <laughs> the the transfer, uh, and we are inheriting it. Um, I, I, I'm of two minds about it. I mean, I am generally supportive of streets for people, making streets safer for, pe for pedestrians and cyclists. I, to some degree, like that the city all of a sudden feels like an adult playground. However, I have a lot of concerns about it as well. I've observed a number of people completely dis regarding traffic laws, disregarding the rules that uh, are in place around the scooters, including And they're children. on sidewalks. We have some video here of people on sidewalks. They're not yes, supposed to be on sidewalks. they should not. I mean, the basic rules are you have a driver's license, you're 18 years or older, you wear a helmet, and you drive and you use bike lanes or um, car lanes, and you follow traffic laws. So I've seen kids riding them. I haven't seen a single helmet in use. Uh, and I'm also very concerned with the level of disregard users are showing for pedestrians um, leaving these scooters all over city sidewalks and really inconvenient places that uh, 
are going to create or have created safety hazards and also barriers for people with mobility challenges or vision impairments. They don't need more obstacles in a city that's as far behind on ADA compliance as we are. We have some data from the Willamette Week. They reported some data from PBOT that shows that Portlanders are enthusiastically embracing these e-scooters. The numbers are going up every day, as you can see here on this calendar. People will ride them on the weekend, decide they kind of like them, and keep riding them starting in, on Monday. The last numbers we have are from August 19th, showing 8,000 scooter rides a day. You're getting a lot of calls into your office. What's the number one complaint that you get? I would say the number one complaint right now, well, it's the disregard of, of traffic laws that people are showing on, on the streets. I mean, I was recently driving through the Mississippi neighborhood on the, on the way to a shop, and within three blocks I saw five people breaking traffic laws, and uh, that's fine when there's no, well, I shouldn't say that. If there are no cars around, I understand maybe being a little carefree on your scooter, but there were cars and there were scooters um, stopped in the middle of the street, riding the wrong way down the street. So um, will you and the council have final say on whether this program goes forward after the four months? Yes, it's it's absolutely up to us. And Sounds some like maybe you're leaning said no. against it, maybe. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but I'm definitely uh, if we continue this, it needs to come with a big public education campaign so we can pe keep people safe. You were one of the most vocal supporters of the Occupy ICE protest outside the ICE offices in Southwest Portland. And this week at an event to praise federal immigration officers, President Trump referenced the, the ICE occupied office um, in Portland. He called out Mayor Wheeler and the city calling the mayor shameful. So let's listen to what President Trump had to say and then I'll get your reaction. Last month, the mayor of Portland, Oregon, shamefully ordered local police to stand down, leaving federal law enforcement officers to face an angry mob of violent people. Any politician who puts criminal aliens before American citizens should find a new line of work. And now there are two Republican U.S. senators calling for Mayor Wheeler to step down over this. And, of course, he says he won't, and they really can't make him do that. But you it seem to be in pretty much agreement with the mayor on how the, the Occupy ICE camp was handled. What's your reaction to what the president said? Well, I'd say that that was a gross mischaracterization of the mayor's response to the camp, as well as... Um, what's going on in the larger picture with immigration. Um, you know, there's an old adage that a stop clock is right, even right, two times a day, and somehow uh, pre President Trump defies that logic. Um, <laughs> I I've hear very little that comes out of his mouth that is accurate or true. We know the camp was allowed to stay for five weeks, and the campers left behind 15 thousand pounds of trash at a cost of almost $25,000 to clean it all up, paid by TriMet, PBOT, and Portland Police. Ultimately, that's going to cost taxpayers. A lot of Portlanders, in fact, we did an unscientific poll of hundreds of people, the vast majority felt that the city should have stepped in sooner and should have been tougher on enforcement with the campers. Do you have any regrets? I don't have regrets. I will say it's a very complicated issue, and I don't know that we have time to really hash out these issues in the 15 minutes I have here. Um, the city stands against the federal government's current immigration policies. We feel that the federal government is violating people's constitutional rights. Um, and every court ruling thus far has shown that we are on the right side of this issue and we're on the right side of the law. And I, yes, there was a cost to the taxpayers uh, for the camp. There's also a much bigger cost to taxpayers and to society as a whole to have families torn apart, to have uh, upstanding residents and community community members torn from their their families, their jobs, their businesses, and deported uh, when they have merit to stay. And and that's, that's the battle we're facing. If there's another protest, another Occupy ICE, would you do anything differently? 
Would I do anything different? I mean, that's, it's hard to answer a hypothetical. Uh, it's obviously going to depend on the circumstances. People have a right to peacefully assemble and to protest their government. Uh, we worked with not just the camp, um, with a group called Abolish ICE. I know it gets a little um, confusing with all the different names and players, as well as the city and and the and DHS to try to negotiate uh, understanding and agreement and to keep people safe. And there was a point at which we felt like we could no longer do that. And that's that's the point at which. Uh, Abolish ICE chose to disband, and I officially withdrew my support of the camp, but not of the fight in well, general. You know, at one point, the city, and under your Office of Permitting, was going to cite ICE for building this eight-foot fence. You didn't, but you were going to, while not citing campers for their fences, their tarps, blocking the sidewalk, blocking the street. We had reporters who witnessed racial slurs people banging on cars, dumping urine down storm drains, defecation. So there were a lot of people who felt like the city was hypocritical in not enforcing those laws, looking the other way, having a hands-off policy. Is it appropriate to base your policing decisions on your politics? I don't believe that was what has ha happened at all. Uh, to be clear, the citation for the fence did not come from my office or from BDS leadership, it was a random occurrence of one of our um, enforcement folks being out in the area for another issue, noticing this tall fence and issuing a citation. I believe what happened was that fence was on federal, well, it's leased by the federal government and therefore our rules didn't apply. So but still there were a lot of other rules and laws that were being broken at the camp that were not enforced. That. Portland police weren't allowed to do anything. They had to have a hands-off approach. And people felt like you weren't protecting all citizens, neighbors near the camp, people trying to use the street, federal officers. Was that selective enforcement? The mayor's position was that this was an issue with the federal government and they have their own police to deal with the protesters and it was, it was up to them uh, to deal with with the protesters. The police were called numerous times and every call was responded to. Maybe not, it didn't entail a visit to the camp uh, it, because these were non-emergency calls, but we worked with neighbors, we worked with businesses, we negotiated to reopen Bancroft Street, which was repeatedly closed by the feds. It's like I said, it's, it's a complicated issue. It's hard to, it's going to be hard to hash it all out here. Um, it's, it's just a very challenging issue. When you feel that your federal government is endangering people's lives and violating their constitutional rights, what is appropriate to do? And, and that, soon in November, voters are going to vote on whether they want to keep sanctuary status for the state that's been on the books for 30 years, either keep it or repeal it. Why do you think it's important that Portland keep that sanctuary status? Because of the very reasons I've been detailing. Um, Are you worried that it might not pass? That it might pass to repeal the sanctuary status? I am concerned uh, because again, it's a complicated issue and a lot of, a lot of people uh, have a strong initial reaction to this issue and may not be willing to educate themselves on it. Uh, we need to defend our immigrant families and we need to give them the due process that they are entitled to by the law and we need to let the immigration courts decide whether or not they have a right to be there. That's not for city council to decide, it's not for the public to decide, it's not for the police to decide. Um, and, and what we're fighting for is, it's it really comes down to constitutional rights. I want to ask you something else that you're, t you're working on, an ordinance that involves renters. It, you authored a new policy that would make some changes on security deposits and screening of renters. Right now, landlords can charge whatever they want, I think, for a security deposit. What would your new ordinance do? Well, it, it achieves many things, but I'm gonna, I'll run down the big ones. Um, it will limit security deposits to two and a half times the monthly rent. 
it will define reasonable wear and tear. So it's not inventing new rules, just defining very nebulous rules that are already on the books. Um, and those are the two main goals with security deposit reform. And you're also, under this legislation, it calls on landlords to accept tenants with past criminal history or justify why they feel they're a threat. The policy includes allowing tenants with convictions from more than three years ago, felony assault and battery, misdemeanor domestic violence, robbery offenses that involve no weapons, sex offenses that did not involve force. Under the policy, they'd have to allow them as tenants. And the president of the Rental Housing Alliance told the Willamette Week the ordinance is activism run amok and it amounts to requiring landlords to become social workers and psychologists. Is it fair to require landlords to accept tenants with a criminal history? So that's another mischaracterization of our policy. We're not inventing new, new rules. These rules all actually already exist. Landlords are required to allow, uh, to consider people that have marks on their records, such as prior convictions. And uh, if they are going to, in the event that, that a conviction is there, they're required to do an individual assessment. We've really been leaving it, the burden on the landlord to figure out what that means. We've left this process open to housing discrimination. And so this policy really helps landlords better, uh, better comply with fair housing laws. So we are absolutely not forcing landlords to take tenants that they, tomorrow, that they wouldn't take today. What we are saying is that in these, under these circumstances, there are mitigating factors that should be taken into account. Um, I have a friend who has a conviction from 30 years ago. She's been a you know, productive member of society. She's raised children and grandchildren. She is a renter. That conviction from 30 years ago still constitutes a barrier to housing for her. And I don't think that that is reasonable. And the outcomes for our community are very negative when people can't find housing. Commissioner Daly, I have to stop you there. We're out of time, but thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. When we come back, we're going to look at sexual harassment in Portland's tech industry. We're back in two minutes.